As Tigana holds Susan, Ian considers appealing to his better nature. But then he thinks, sod it, and goes for his worst nature instead. Unfortunately that doesn't work and the Doctor and Barbara are forced to leave TARDIS. Marco appears, disturbed not by the commotion but the strange unearthly music that seems to be playing in the ether. The Doctor must have left the TARDIS radio on again. There is no need! What's happened? We all have escaped had I not caught this one. Tell that man to take his hands off my grandchild. The key first, Doctor. Marco demands the TARDIS key in exchange for Susan. The Doctor hands it over, leaving a pause just long enough to give Susan time to think about her poor decision making. As he hands it over, Tigana tries to stab him, but he's stopped by Marco. As Marco is interrogating the travellers on where they got the key, Ping Chow appears. Ian takes one for the team and insists that he took it. Marco, not willing to pursue this too much, just in case Ian spills the beans on the contents of his special journals, deflects and tells them that they won't see TARDIS again until they reach the Khan Summer Palace. After a day of hard riding, Marco orders a stop at an inn. TARDIS has been reclassified as baggage and is travelling with a separate caravan. Hopefully it won't get lost and end up somewhere in Eastern Europe. As Ian admires the artwork of the local hostelry they're staying in, Barbara insists he needs to talk to Marco again. Marco enters the room and Barbara pulls the old Oh, I'm tired and going off to bed routine. But because she's smart about these things, she does it in a no-nonsense, straightforward way. Oh, Marco, Ian wants a word with you. Oh. I'm feeling a bit tired, so I think I'll go off to bed. None of that. Oh, uh, I've just got to go and do that, that thing, you know, that uh, thing I've been meaning to do for, oh, ages. Hammy crap for her. Ian pleads with Marco for the TARDIS, but to little avail. Marco, to his credit, offers to take them with him to Venice so they can head back to Britain by boat. But this won't work for Ian, as the last thing they need is to be confronted by some 13th century St George fanatics and accused of trying to enter the country illegally. Out of desperation, Ian decides to go for broke and tell Marco the truth about TARDIS. At mention of England, Marco is quick to bring up how the Crusaders made the journey 25 years ago. Although for Ian, that was 700 years ago, and unbeknownst to him, 45, or perhaps 46, episodes in the future. As Ian continues to try to convince Marco of the ship's special abilities, he's given some hope as Marco seems quite open-minded to the fantastical. Even if the fantastical to him is, um, burning coal? Sadly for the increasingly confident science teacher, 
A time travelling caravan is a step too far into the ludicrous. Ian's frustration is not helped by the imagined sounds of a smug and chuckling doctor asking him how he likes them apples. <laughs> As a final test of Ian's honesty, Marco asks where he got the key. Ian's inability to adequately describe any of the degradations in Marco's book confirmed what he suspected, that it was Ping Chao who actually took the key. Ian's honourable attempt at deception proves that he's capable of lying, so Marco doesn't believe his tales about time travel. In the girls' room, Ping Chao watches as Susan sleeps. After the romantic illusion of doing so is broken, by the reality of pillow slobbering and unflattering grunts and chunters, she leaves the room. The next morning, everyone is looking for the missing Ping Cho. Susan blames herself, after waking up with a sore throat and her face in what she first thought was a swamp. She realised she must have been particularly unflattering last night. Tigana's unhidden glee at Marco's dilemma continue on to meet the Khan or go back to look for Ping Cho is short lived as Ian offers to search for the missing girl. Tigana's sharp edged response to Barbara telling Marco not to underestimate Ian does not go unnoticed by her. Very good advice, Marco. At Cheng Ting Wai Station, Wang Lo is thrilled that the costume makers for his new pantomime dame outfit have arrived. He can't wait for audience to meet his new creation, Dame Flocculent Honeypot. Wang Lo is distracted by Kuiji, who says he has come to collect Marco's trade caravan. Distracted, Wang Lo quickly points Kuiji towards the stables before heading off to his costume fitting. Ping Chao approaches the absolutely trustworthy Kuiji and asks to join his caravan. After her initial offer of monkey spanker is declined, Kuiji's primate friend being particularly badly behaved today, she offers to pay in cash. Kuiji takes the money and promises on his good eye to come back for her after making some arrangements. Later, an incredulous Wang Lo breaks the news to Ping Chao that she's been scammed. Just as it seems all hope is lost for the young girl, Ian appears in a puff of chivalry. The late 20th century gentleman holds her comfortingly as she bears her soul and pleads with him not to take her back and force her to marry an old man. He says he's going to take her anyway, browse before, it, well, you get the point. An old man appears with paperwork authorising him to collect Marco's trade caravan, including TARDIS. A flustered Wang Lao tries to downplay the situation, but sharp-minded Ian realises that the ship has been stolen and that Wang Lo has also been scammed. Marco writes in his diary about how pleased he is with their progress. Now they are only about 50 miles from the Summer Palace. He'll soon be free of the doctor's non-stop asking, are we nearly there yet? And regular toilet stops. Later that evening, Marco and Tigana are having a massive domestic Tigana being jealous of Marco's affections drifting towards Ian. Yeah. 
Susan and Barbara enter and Tigana immediately turns his envious wrath on them, claiming that Ian has already failed. Barbara's having none of it though, and soon puts him in his place. Susan throws a spanner in the works by blabbing that she hopes Ping Chow isn't found. Jesus Christ, Susan! Tigana goes on a misogynist rant about how she'll be alone and friendless if she doesn't marry the shriveled old chamois leather that is her intended. After Barbara is unwittingly brought into the argument and has to admit that none of the travellers agree with the age gap marriage, such reality shows not being around in the 1960s or on Gallifrey. Marco gives Tigana leave to go after Ian to make sure he does go after Ping Chow and not just Tardis. More good work from Susan, mouth before mind foreman. At the way station, Ian and Ping Chow are studying a map. With typical man reading a map pride, Ian refuses to listen to Ping Chow's suggestion that the Tardis has been taken along the Karakoram Road. He tries to mansplain to her about the area but not having access to Barbara's big history brain is immediately put in his place by the young girl's local knowledge. Arriving at the Summer Palace, Susan, Barbara, the Doctor and Marco marvel at the incredible architecture on display in the expansive grounds. A pity such immense beauty was something too broad and too deep for a 1960s BBC budget. Or a 1970s BBC budget. Or a 1980s BBC budget? Or a 1990s BBC budget? Or a 2000s BBC budget? Or a 2010s BBC budget? Or a 2020s BBC budget? Or a 2030s BBC budget? Or a 2040s BBC budget? Or a 2050s ITV, ITV budget? Kublai Khan's vizier instructs everyone to kneel and kowtow when the Khan enters. The doctor loudly refuses to risk putting his back out by bending the knee in deference. He'll only do it if it's for something meaningful, like a protest or one of the Cranky's special parties. The vizier introduces the Khan as if he's a wrestler. Out now before the warlord of warlords, mighty and fearful in his strength. How tow before the ruler of Asia, India, Cathay, and other territories. How tow before the master of the world. As a small, frail old man hobbles into the room, everyone kowtows. Susan manages to encourage the doctor to comply, which he does, but he makes sure to loudly vocalise his discomfort and annoyance. After his special ring-shaped cushion has been placed on his throne, the Khan carefully sits down. As the Doctor continues to make a huge show of his discomfort, the Khan accuses him of mockery. The Doctor goes full hyperbole and claims his back is broken, and then claims he's far from unwell. I'm sure that this was a deliberate and clever ruse by the Doctor to befuddle the Khan, as he relents and tells everyone to stand up. The Khan asks where Tigana is, because Nokai's army has been seen at Karakoram. Marco is shocked by this development, and the Khan is very keen to hear Tigana's explanation when he arrives. The Khan decides they must ride for Peking the following day. The Doctor is delighted at the idea of more horse riding in his immediate future. The Khan Charmed somewhat by having another cantankerous ailment riddled old duffer to bond with, invites the doctor to join him in his carriage of state. As he painfully starts to shuffle away, the Khan invites the doctor to join him in the healing waters he uses to help his aches and pains. The doctor manages to hide his pleasure at this trip, suddenly becoming a VIP spa break. The two old men shuffle out of the room, seemingly in competition to see who can moan the loudest. Susan is lucky to not have her head cut off by loudly mocking the Khan's frailty. Now sooner have they both left the room. 
Barbara doesn't want to leave without Ian and Ping Chow, and she's not convinced when Marco reassures her that Tigana will bring them to Peking. That night on the Karakoram Road, Ian and Ping Chow see Kuiji waiting for something. Ian's terrible attempt at stealth immediately draws Kuiji's attention. Luckily, Ping Chow's quick thinking distracts him, so Ian is able to disarm him. Kuiji is quick to give Ping Chow her money back, and also to inform them that it was Tigana who wanted the TARDIS. Ian acts shocked at this revelation, as if he hasn't been suspicious of the Warlord for the last several episodes. Tigana appears and calls Ian's bluff when he threatens to kill Kuiji. Ian squares up to Tigana, ready for some physical man-on-man -man action. Tigana, sensing the change in atmosphere, invites Ian to come. Ooh, I can't wait to see how this plays out. <laughs> <laughs>